Well, let's pray and dive into what the Lord has for us this morning. Father, I just give you so much gratitude and thanksgiving. When we speak about Father's Day, we thank you. You are a loving, heavenly Father who has set the precedent, who, who has set what loving kindness should be all about. We thank you for your great love. And now as we dive into what you have put on my heart and concluding our series, Father, we thank you that you have great things to say to your people, to your children. And I pray that you would deposit a very individual message and word and encouragement to everybody within the sound of my voice. We love you, Lord. Now go before us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. In my first year of uh, Bible college, I had an English professor, love this guy, and uh, he's now working at Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, great, great, wonderful man. And he shared a story one time uh, as we were supposed to be learning about English, and he took a bunny trail and, and really started teaching some things about God. And one thing he mentioned that where, where I used to live in San Diego, uh, there's an interstate, uh, Interstate 15, that takes you from Southern California area up to Las Vegas. And halfway between the two is a little city called Barstow. And a lot of people like to stop there for food, for gas, for whatever they need. And the thing is, when you're driving from Barstow to Las Vegas, there is nothing. I mean, like West Texas, flat, boring, dirt, nothing green, not even animals are out there. There's just nothing. It's desolate wilderness. But what he noticed is that so many times he would see a telephone pole that was completely caved in, meaning a car had crashed into it. Now, you would think you're out in the open road, there is nothing around, and your car loses control, and out of all the things you can hit, tumbleweeds, cactus, all the things you can hit, how in the world do you hit a telephone pole? Now, the thing is, we have the subconscious thing about us humans, that wherever we direct our attention, subconsciously, our body wants to gravitate towards so as you're losing control, you're so focused on this telephone pole and not hitting it, rather than focusing on where you want your car to go, you end up crashing into the telephone pole, even though you've been trying to avoid it. You got to direct your, when you're out of control, here's a little driving tip, when you're spinning out of control, fix your gaze on where you want your car to go, and your body will also subconsciously help you to get there. And so he compared this to our walk with the Lord that we will truly worship that which we fear. You fear, as in respect, you worship it. And the sad thing is we can worship other things other than God. Wherever your attention, wherever your focus, there your heart will be also. And so he deposited this message in us that the number one focus in our life, as we've been talking about the presence of God, should be the face of the Father. His presence in the Old Testament, the word presence oftentimes was translated as the face of God, intimacy, face to face. And Jesus talked about this all the time. Jesus, who was the perfect physical representation of the Father on earth, demonstrated to you and I how we should respond to the Father and how our relationship with the Father should be as well. In John 5, Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. John 12, I will only speak that which with the Father speaks to me about. In John 15, Jesus stresses so much about how much we need to abide in the vine. The greatest thing that you and I can do as children of God, as human beings, is to abide and listen to the voice of God. And likewise, the greatest danger we will ever have in life, the greatest danger is ignoring or running away from the very voice of God that brings us such life. I am unapologetic when I say that Christians, God's children, should be the richest, should be the healthiest, the most well-off, the most talented, the most inventive, creative people on planet Earth. And the reason I'm unapologetic about that is because we have something that many in this world do not have, and that is access to the creator of the universe. Sometimes we fail to remember that we can talk to the one who spoke and created everything that's in existence. And if we can speak to the Spirit of God, if we can commune with the Father, if we have all these benefits from Jesus Christ, we have an advantage in our world of work, in our world of creativity, in our artistic expressions, in our relationships, because at any moment, at any time, we can go before the Father and say, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. Help me. Speak to me. Teach me. Train me. We have access to the creator of the world, and sometimes we fail to remember that. But other times, life happens. There's pain. There's bad circumstances. 
there's betrayal, there's, there's bad things that happen to good people, and it's super unfortunate, but it's no excuse for us not to press in. God's presence is our life source. His voice is what sustains us, and we cannot ignore that. Sometimes it can be the difference between life and death. There's a great story by Andrew Walmack, who was sharing a time when he wanted to go back to Costa Rica. He felt like he was being led to go on another missions trip down in Central America, and he booked a flight, and after he booked a flight, he just kind of lost a desire to go. You guys ever done that before where you're all set for something and out of nowhere, your emotion changed to it? He lost the desire whatsoever. And his desire continued to get lower and lower to the point where he was even dreading going on this trip. Finally, he spent several hours in prayer and got to the place of peace and said, if I don't feel like going, there may be more to this. And so he canceled the flight right away. He called the host in Costa Rica and said, sorry, I can't come anymore. They said, oh no, why not? He's like, don't feel like it. (laughs) Just matter of fact and so honest, I I don't feel like coming anymore. And so they were a little upset, but he had to go with what he had to go with. And later that week, the exact plane that he should have been on outside of Mexico City crashed, killing all 162 occupants. Now, if he didn't go with that gut feeling, which God's voice isn't always this booming thunder in the clouds. God's voice can be a nudging. God's voice can be a pulling. God's voice can be a peace or a lack of peace. God's voice can be so many different things, but we cannot afford, we cannot afford to go without listening to the voice of God. And many reasons why we feel like God is either silent with us or we're not hearing clearly. Lots of reasons, fear, doubt, confusion, abuses of the past, preachers who have said something and then fell into sin, all these type of things. And one really big area that desensitizes us to the presence and the face and the voice of God is sin. And so this morning, I waited till the very last minute to ask my wife to be a prop this morning. So I'm going to invite my bride up here to the quote stage. And I want to illustrate something. Honey, if you could stand right here. Today, my wife is going to stand in the example of God. So don't take that to your head. (laughs) But she is going to represent God in this analogy. So us and God, give me your hands, lovely. This is what our relationship with God should be like. Face-to-face, hand-in-hand, heart-to-heart intimacy. This is the picture of what we should be like father-to-child in the walk of the Christian. But what ends up happening sometimes is though we have intimacy, sometimes we sin against that relationship. We do things that are not in God's nature. And when that happens, many people believe that this is what God does. If I can have you face the wall, that when we sin, God turns his back to us. Oh no, I've wronged him. Now now God is angry. God is upset with me. God, God doesn't want anything to do with me anymore. I've sinned. I failed in this relationship. But God will never turn his back on us. God will never leave us, never forsake us. What really happens when we sin is that we are the ones that turn our backs to God. He never turns his face from us. God is always speaking. God always loves us no matter what we do. But we turn our backs to God, even though he's there, even though we know he loves us, we sin and now we're not seeing his face. We're seeing all other things. We're distracted. We're desensitized to his presence. Even though he's there, it's like, is he really? We start doubting because we can't see. The longer you stay in a habitual sin, the more you will step away from a sensitivity. Now I'm starting to feel a little bit numb. The longer you stay there, now I'm starting to feel a little discouraged and depressed. Now I'm starting to feel pretty darn hopeless. And we see how far along we've we've come from the presence of God. Now God is loving. He's never turned our back on us. We are the ones in our own will that did this to ourselves. But even this right here, this separation is a lie. Let me explain. So when I am supposed to be loving the Father and I turn my back because of sin, this this is really what happens. Oh, I've sinned. Oh, I keep on sinning. Now I feel discouraged. Oh, now I'm feeling completely hopeless. My back's still towards God, and I'm so lost in my sin, but then I come to this prodigal son moment where I come to my senses. What am I doing? The Holy Spirit is interceding and working on my heart this entire time. I'm being wooed back to his presence. My heart is breaking for the things that I've done. I'm being overwhelmed by his presence and his goodness, and I'm like, God, why did I... Sometimes we just need to stop, come to our senses, turn around and see a God who's never forsaken us. He's always there. Then, take your hands, now walk backwards. He can bring us and restore us in intimacy right back to where we should have been. 
The preacher's wife, ladies and gentlemen, give her a round of applause for her help. <laughs> Thank you, lovely. That's God's heart for us. He's always with us. And he wants to speak to us. He wants to bless us. So here's the real issue. Please hear me on this. Here's the issue. The issue is not so much our inability to hear God's voice. It's not so much the inability to hear God's voice as much as it is the willingness to listen to other voices, the willingness to turn our back to him and entertain all other voices. If you didn't know or not, there's many voices going on in your head every single day. You're not crazy, but you got a bunch of voices going on inside of your head. In fact, there's a great book uh, that talks about the power of confession. And the title is, You're Crazy If You Don't Talk to Yourself. The power of confessing God's word so that your own ear can hear it. But we hear multiple voices in our head throughout the day. You can hear the voice of God, you can hear your own voice. You can hear the voice of the devil, demons. You can hear angels. You can hear uh, the voice of your own ego. There's multiple things that you can hear. And our job as believers is to decipher which one is God and which one is the enemy, which one is our own voice. It's so easy to figure this out. I mean, when we boil it down to just the basics. Now, if you hear something that's lined up to the word of God, it brings life. It draws you closer to God. It's completely founded in what God would say in his word. That's God's voice. If you hear something that's focused on you and my ego and my pride and what others would think about me, human nature, we want to focus on ourselves. When you take a group picture and you see that picture, what's the first person you look for? Yourself, <laughs> you know, because we're naturally inclined to think about ourselves. Now, if you hear something that brings fear and discouragement and all these type of things, doubt, that's not of God. That's the enemy's voice. You got to throw that out. And if you hear other things that may not be God, may not be you, but, but elevate you to, to draw closer to him, it could be the voice of an angel and, and other things. You know, sadly, a lot of people say that um, they can confess and say, I heard a, a, a demon say something to me in the middle of the night when I was sleeping. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, were you afraid? But if somebody said an angel spoke to me, ooh, loony bin, send this person off, he's kind of crazy. But there are supernatural beings that will be speaking to you, good and bad. We need to understand and discern the difference between it. Now, the problem is that within all these voices, they all sound like your voice. So within your own conscience, your own mind, your own heart, and how you feel, you're going to hear, hear lots of things creeping into your spirit all throughout the day. You have to decide which ones are from God, which ones are not, so that you can reject the lies and only receive the truth. Now, the greatest thing about God's voice, that no matter how you feel, no matter what you're going through, no matter how discouraged you may be, if you have the strength to pick up a Bible and open it up, you will hear the literal voice of God, no matter what. I heard a preacher say that if you are discouraged today, you don't know where to start. You feel so numb, so lost, so apathetic in God. Pick up the Psalms, start reading, and keep reading until you can hear your own voice and emotions in it. Just keep reading and he will speak to you, bottom line. And so what we need to do is take the filter of God's word and apply it to our thoughts. However, we may hear God and, and God can speak in multiple ways through a dream, through other people. Psalm 19 talks about the heavens declare the glory of God. God can speak through nature. God can speak through a sunset. God can speak through so many different ways, but it's the word of God that helps us to determine whether it's his voice or not. We got to use the filter of God's word. And speaking of God's word, today uh, for our scripture to study, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 13. So if you have a Bible, you can go with me to the gospel of Matthew chapter 13. And when we're talking about the voice of God, there were so many different places I could have gone this morning. I could have gone to 1 Samuel chapter 3 and little Samuel who hears God's voice in the temple and his learning God's voice. I could have talked about Jesus' uh, parable of the sheep in John chapter 10 and how they are my sheep and they hear my voice. So many, but as I, I spent too much time this week trying to decide on which scripture to bring for this sermon. And the Lord kept bringing me to this one, Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, the parable of the sower. And there's some things in here that I really feel are going to help us to discover the voice of God more clearly for ourselves. As always, the New American Standard, beginning in verse 1. That day Jesus went out of his house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him, so he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and other birds came and ate them up. 
And others fell along rocky places where they did not have much soil and immediately sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. So we're going to pause right there. We're going to continue to read, but we need to understand that the parable that Jesus is given, the soil in itself is our hearts. The seed is the very word of God. What's so amazing about seeds is that a seed, like an acorn, doesn't just have one tree in it. It has the potential of billions of trees. And the word of God is not just one word for you for one day, one hour. The word of God is so pregnant. If God delivers a word to you, either prophetically, through his word, individually, if God gives you a word, it is our job to steward that because that word may continue to blossom. And I mean, I have some, some prophetic words that were given to me years ago, and I still have them written down. And every now and then I pull up that file and I read over the prophetic words that somebody gave to me. And I can't tell you how many times a word that was given to me in 2003, and now it's 2021, and is bringing a new form and a new meaning and a new revelation. God's word is pregnant, and we need to position our hearts to do so. Let's scroll down to verse 18, and Jesus gives the explanation. I love that even the ones closest to Jesus, his own disciples, were like, great story, Jesus. I don't get it. <laughs> Help me understand. And Jesus, being so gracious, helps us to uh, explain. Verse 18, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes to snatch it away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one whose, whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself. I love how the New American Standard says no root in himself. See, you can get something from the Lord or read something in the Bible as a young believer and you're so excited about it and you just run with it, but you have no identity. You, you haven't been completely sold to your authority and dominion in God. And because of that, it says here it has no firm root in itself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And on the one whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world, all the distractions and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one whom the seed was sown on good soil, a good heart, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings some a hundredfold, 60 and 30. And the key word in this entire passage here is understands, understands. In the Greek, that word is phenomenal because uh, the Bible translates understand or discerns. It uses multiple words, but specifically this word in the Greek really means understand. And the definition is to bring one thing and another thing and combine them. That's the definition, one definition of understanding here. So to truly understand the voice of God means that you take his heart, his revelation, your lack of understanding, your humanity, and it comes together where the light bulb comes on and you get this direct revelation from the Lord. There is nothing sweeter, no greater treasure or prize on earth than when you're studying God's word or you're in an, an intimate time with him and something comes alive just for you. I, got specific, I have a, a file on my computer of every word that God gave to me that's not from another preacher, that's not from another conference or anything. It's God's word, his heart to me. It became alive, and I can preach that a thousand different ways. We need to hide the word of God in our heart. And the reality is our heart needs to be in a great place to clearly hear from God. If our, the soil is our heart, then whatever grows in your garden is the seed that you planted in your garden. Whatever grows is what you sowed. The overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's crystal clear. So we need to learn how to hear God's voice clearly. If you're taking notes and in your bulletin, you can fill these in. Point number one, the voice of God is about relationship, not routine. The voice of God is more so about relationship than it is routine. Heard a true story years ago about a seminary student from Brazil and he wanted to have coffee with the, um, his professor. They were driving down the road and they found a Starbucks and they went through a drive-through and they got coffee and they're on the road heading back and 
this seminary student looks really discouraged and not saying anything where he was normally pretty chatty beforehand. And the uh, professor says, did I do something wrong? Did, did I offend you? You know, was there something wrong? He's like, no, well, when we said, let's go get coffee, I thought it meant we go inside, we sit down, we share a conversation, we, we get to know each other a whole lot more, but I didn't just want the beverage, I wanted the relationship. And I shared that story years ago at a church I was running in San Diego that had a bunch of uh, Brazilian couples in the, the crowd. And one of them comes up to me after the service laughing hysterically. I said, what? She goes, you don't understand Brazilians. When you say, let's have a coffee, that means clear your calendar for at least five hours. That means come over, sit down. It's going to be a long time. That means opening up your heart and sharing life. And that's exactly what, what God would want for us, that his voice is individual. It's not just about routines and, and formulas. There's no formula to hear the voice of God. It's knowing him more and more intimately for yourself. Jesus did 27 miracles. What we have in the Gospels, what we can record around 27 different miracles that he performed. And the amazing thing about that is that every one of those miracles was done a different way. Now, isn't that incredible that Jesus performed a miracle, a supernatural miracle, a different way each time? So if Jesus did a miracle the same way every single time, we would just read the Bible and say, that's exactly how we're going to do it. We're not going to do it any other way. But Jesus himself modeled that it's through relationship, being one with the Father, knowing him, that we can go ahead and expand the kingdom of God. It's like the relationship with my wife. Uh, as we're settling more and more into our home in Duncanville, now we're at the place where it's not setting up furniture or moving things where they need to be. Now it's all the tiny details of organization. And my wife is an organizing queen. I mean, her label maker right now is probably smoking. She's just gone to town on every jar and cabinet and every little thing. And I play this cute little game called, where did my wife put that now? That's, that's my new game. So I, I go to the coffee maker and normally there's coffee right there, but the coffee's not there anymore. I'm like, because my wife doesn't like clutter countertops. She likes the bare minimum. So I have to think, my wife doesn't like countertops. I don't know where the coffee is, but if I were my wife, where would that coffee be? Probably close to it. So I open up the first cabinet and it's there. You know, like, where did my wife put the paper towels? The paper towels used to be right here by the refrigerator. Now they're gone. I have to remember, well, my wife doesn't like paper products. She loves the earth and doesn't want to see us destroyed. So we use real towels. So if I was my wife, the paper towels wouldn't be in the kitchen where I'd have to use them. They'd be in the pantry. And I got to go all the way over and find a paper towel for the bacon, you know, to let out the grease. So because I know my wife, when I'm face to face with mystery, I have to put myself in her shoes. And oftentimes I can find what I need. How much more for the father? Where when we're faced in life with mystery, we want to hear his voice. It's through intimacy and knowing him, developing our own history with God that we begin to hear more clearly from him. Beautiful scriptures in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, 13. This says, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. A promise. You want God? You want to hear from him? If you do any effort into seeking him, you will find him. And then there's a verse I call my 24-7 verse, Jeremiah 24-7, and God declares prophetically, I will give them a heart to know me. So we have supernatural help from God that if you're struggling hearing his voice clearly or knowing for, for certain that it is God's voice speaking to you, just pray. Supernaturally, Father, I pray you give me ears to hear. May you give me a heart to know you better. I want to hear your voice clearly here. Help me. Help me to understand you more. So God's voice is more about relationship than it is about routine. Don't get so stuck in your morning devotion, all the good things you do for God. There's nothing wrong with those. Keep doing those. But don't get so stuck that that's the only way you can hear from God. Open your heart to every moment in your day to clearly hear from him. He wants to speak to you. Number two, the voice of God needs to be stewarded, not squandered. The voice of God needs to be stewarded not squandered. So when God speaks to you, it's got to be like the greatest gift you've ever received in your life. Now, th the reality is that God is always speaking. God is like that little two-year-old girl in the restaurant that's like, she just wants to talk. 
Anybody have a grandchild or a little kid that they just have to talk? It doesn't matter what you talk about. They just have to talk. I'm not disrespectful to the father, but that's how I feel he is. He loves to talk. He wants to talk about everything. He wants to talk about anything. God cares about the details if he can have your heart. He always wants to speak. And so if you feel like God is not speaking to you, the problem is on our side of the equation. The issue is not God because he's always speaking. Just pick up a Bible. He's always talking. The problem is on our side of the equation. And there's many reasons why we don't hear God clearly. And one of those reasons is that we feel he's being silent because he told us to do something last week and we have failed to obey it. We still haven't entertained it. We still haven't massaged it. And now we're asking him for something new. He's like, I already spoke to you. And because we fail to receive that and to steward that word and to let that word marinate, now we've forgotten the small detail that he already spoke to us. Or, or an elementary thing about our faith that we fail to recognize, like we can talk to the creator of the universe. What a profound thing. But every day we kind of forget that, oh yeah, I, I can talk to the inventor of the universe, the one who holds the universe in his hand. I can talk to that guy. And we go about our day as if it wasn't even a reality. So we have to remember the little things in life. There, there's a story of a young pastor who was just getting started in ministry and he went up to an older pastor, a seasoned pastor, for some advice. He says, you know, I, I just am struggling hearing God's voice to discover what God's will is for my life. And the older pastor says, well, that's pretty easy. On earth as it is in, king, in, on, on earth as it is in heaven. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers. He's like, yeah, 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 I get that. I understand that. But like God's will for my life, like, should I stay single? Should I get married? And the older pastor says, well, what do you want to be? Do you want to be married? Yeah, I would love to find that special person and and get married. He's like, great, we'll get married. And then heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons and cleanse the lepers. It's like, no, I understand. But like God's will for my life, like in ministry, what am I supposed to do? I I feel called to the ministry, but I just don't know what. He's like, what do you like to do? Well, of all things in a church, I I really like blessing the kids. I, I love the children's ministry. He's like, great. So go sign up for children's ministry, then heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and cleanse the lepers. It's not that difficult. God's will for our lives is to be intimate with him, have a conversation, hear his voice, and expand his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But God's not going to force anything on us. That's why I love in in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, you have this probably 15-year-old little Mary who sees an angel, and the angel tells this teenager, guess what? You're going to become pregnant by God, and you're going to birth God, who is going to be the hero, the savior of the entire world. No pressure. <laughs> you know, don't lose them, you know, because they did that once. You know, don't, don't, don't let them fall or get injured as a, as a toddler, as a baby. Make sure you feed them, keep them alive. You're going to have the savior of the world. Now, I don't know how you would react in that situation. I'd have a few questions. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, time out. Whoa there, Mr. Angel. Can we, uh, uh, can, is there any room for uh, discussion here? But what it says in, in verse 19 is that she pondered these things and she treasured it. Other translations say she hid it in her heart. Here you have somebody whose whole life was before them, who the one she was betrothed to could be completely shamed. And it says she heard the word of the Lord and she hid it in her heart. She stewarded it. She treasured it for herself. Is the voice of God your greatest treasure? There's a scripture in Matthew chapter 12 that talks about when you cast out a demon, that demon can go around to waterless places. And then when it comes back and it finds the house, the heart, the person, and the house is empty and in order, it could bring seven demons more and come back and take residence again. And so that's why every time I've cast out a demon into somebody, I've taught them that the enemy has been defeated. I teach them who they are in God, their identity, and the dominion they have over everything in the dark places and and Satan. Because if they're not trained and equipped, worse can come to them. And why do I explain that? What does that have to do with the voice of God? The main thing here is that that house where the demons were coming back to was empty. It was empty. People who struggle with sin, if you're dealing with temptation, if you have a habit you can't kick, if you got a doubt, an anxiety, a fear, something that just won't leave you, let me encourage you here and right now. In your heart, don't let it be empty. Fill that place with God's presence. Fill that place with something of God that is so much greater than any pleasure that you can have in this world. But if it's not there, how quickly the enemy wants to replace that thing, how quickly he, he wants to invade that space to bring doubt. 
And I want to encourage you, do the simple and the easy things in life when it comes to God's voice. Write it down. Sketch it out. Have a conversation. Hey, you know, the other day I had this dream and, and I have no idea what it means. Talk to people about dream interpretation and, and bring it to the word of God. You got to entertain and bring to life the things that God says to you. And then finally, this last point here, the voice of God should be obeyed, not delayed. The voice of God should be obeyed and not delayed. Simple commandments that God gives to us, a simple word that he gives to us, we got to act on right away. Simple, simple things. A couple of years ago, as my son was getting into uh, basketball, um, he was really wanting to be on a team and really go deep with this. And so he wanted a basketball hoop. So I built him, because <laughs> I'm, I'm like that, I built him a wooden basketball hoop, a four by four and a piece of plywood and a little hoop that we bought on Facebook Marketplace. And I said, you know what? If you come out here and play with this thing longer than a week, we'll consider getting you a good one, a, an actual professional one. And he did. He wore that thing out, let me tell you. And he used that thing all the time. I'm like, all right. So we went to the sports store and we picked out one that he liked. And I said, cool, well, I'll, I'll put this together for you. And then you'll have a good one to play on. And I thought that thing would take me about an hour. My Lord, four and a half hours later, I'm still trying to put this thing together that came in a box this big. And I finally finished it. And the final step was to just fill the plastic base with water. You know, because this thing is 10 feet tall and it's heavy, it's metal. You got to fill the base with water so it doesn't tip over. But the hose was on all the way on the other side. And Gabriel knows where I'm going with this. Uh, it was on the other side of the yard. And I said, Gabe, come here, come here. I need your help. I need you to put your foot on the base so that this thing doesn't fall over. If you take your foot off of the base, it will fall over and dent the rim and the ball won't go through it. Do you hear me? Don't move your foot. He goes, yep, yep, cool. Yeah, yeah, sure. He keeps his foot there. I go over to grab the hose. The moment I grab the hose, I look over and I see my kid balancing the entire basketball hoop in his arms. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, took my foot off the base. Why? <laughs> Why? I don't know. Maybe he wanted to see if it would actually happen. Maybe it's like, I'm not supposed to move my foot, but everything in my body says move it. So he's balancing the single thing, and I put it up, and I'm like, I just looked at him like, buddy, huh? <laughs> one simple thing. And as much as I can tease him for that, and it was one of the greatest laughs we had in a long time, as much as I can tease him for that, we are knuckleheaded like that every day with God. He tells us something so simple. Read my word. Commune with me. Bless that person. Pray for that person. And we just sit there, huh? <laughs> And we fail and we wonder why we go through the things that we go through. I'm telling you, we need to obey God and do it quickly. You know, my, my, my advice, and this is what I do, and I've developed a history with God. And in my knower, I know when it's really God's voice. So if I, in my knower, know that I know that it's God speaking to me, I want to obey as quick as possible. Because if I hear God and I wait Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I give the enemy more opportunity to confuse me. Was that really God? Did he really say blah, 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 blah? The second God says it, I want to do it. And I've shared the story before, but I've been in front of 500 people on a healing night, and I heard God tell me, get the worst case in the room. And so before anything started in front of everybody, I could have looked like a complete idiot. And I said, the worst case in the room, a blind kid who had a fever of 103, and God healed him on the spot. Now, if I waited, till the very end of the service, we don't know if that would have happened. I want to obey God as quickly as I can because if I know it's him, I want to do everything to do it. And now, like we testified this morning, we have another thing that we can claim in our arsenal of testimonies of what God has done. And if he's done it then, then he can do it again. We need to develop a history of God through the voice of God. And I'll, I'll conclude with this story as our team gets ready to show our Father's Day video. But I got a great friend in San Diego. His name is Jeff Rose, and he has a hereditary disease. Uh, it's like muscular dystrophy, kind of. He's confined to a wheelchair, but he can kind of stand up and kind of take some walks. And all throughout his life, he's like, why me, God? I wanted to play baseball professionally. I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that. It's not my fault and my family's line has this disease. You said by your stripes, I am healed. He got to the place of addiction and suicide as a young kid. And finally, he got to a place where he says, I'm not a victim to my circumstances. 
And he learned about as a man so thinks in his heart, so is he. And he took that to heart. And so he changed his world and he started going to the gym. He started businesses. He started preaching. He started doing everything possible. And he has a book. uh, It's called uh, Your Ability to Respond. Your circumstances don't define you. And on the picture, he's in like an LA fitness. His wheelchair is on the bottom of a flight of stairs and he's at the top holding himself up. Your circumstances don't define you. And I remember talking, talking with him one time because this guy had the most infectious, contagious, positive, loving nature about him. And I'm in the back of a church one time just talking with him. And, and every time I see him, he's like, oh, you know, I, I felt the Lord was saying to you about this, that, and the other. I'm like, bro, are you like trying to enter the prophetic ministry or what? And I remember he told me one time, no, no. He goes, I just know that when I come to church, I'm probably going to see you. When I ask somebody to go to lunch with me, I know I'm going to see them. When somebody calls and says they want to come over to my house, I know I'm going to see them. So if I know I'm going to see them, I get into a place of prayer and ask the Lord to give a word so that when I see them, I can deliver it. How amazing is that? That before any time you engage with somebody on on a date, an appointment, uh, whatever, that you've been praying to have a word given to them before. And sometimes God may give you nothing. Sometimes he may give you something profound. But he said, I'm always prepared with the word. And that's what I want to leave with you today, is that if you always hide a word of God in your heart, you may never need a word from the Lord. So many times we have an empty heart. We've left our house empty. We have not filled it with God's voice. And we get to a tragedy in our world and we're like, oh God, I need you. But like Jesus commanded the disciples to fast and pray because this kind only comes out with fasting and prayer. He says, your soul must be so built up that when you face the worst case of the enemy, you will still have confidence. When you face the worst thing that life can give to you, you will have this joy that rises up because I know God has spoken to me. God has a plan for this. God has a solution for this. And he actually wants to partner with me to release this into the world. But how dare we come empty handed? How dare we come with not a word hidden in our heart? And so if you've heard anything today in this sermon about God's voice to his children is to hide the word of God in your heart so that when life throws its wickedness at you, you're ready to respond. Amen, church? Well, Father, we are so grateful that on Father's Day, we can declare what a good and loving Father we have in heaven. And thank you, God, that on this earth, you have given us humans who uh, sometimes do great, sometimes don't do so great but you have given them to us as fathers. And God, we thank you that you handpicked them to be our loving fathers here on earth. Thank you today as we celebrate them, honor them, give them gifts, eat a bunch of food we shouldn't be eating, (laughs) and do all these things to celebrate what a great parent is. Today, fathers, we go out. We know that many of us have uh, seen our fathers go on to heaven. There's many of us who grew up with the father who wasn't there. We understand that these holidays can also bring those senses of emotion. And so spirit of peace and of joy, may you come in a special way today that will bless our hearts if we experience those things in life. But as we stand today, we stand in honor of who you are, God, and thank you that you are a God that's not like our earthly parents. You are a God who is perfect in every way in which every good gift comes from above. So we celebrate you, we worship you, we honor you here this day. And as we go out today to celebrate our fathers and do all we need to do, and as we step into Monday and in this week, God, let that continual challenge be on our heart to treat your voice like the greatest gift ever. Be with us this week. Speak incredible things to us. We thank you and we praise you. Go with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Father's Day. God bless you, family.